In this video and the two that follow, we consider examples of topological spaces that are not Hausdorff. For this part, we'll consider the cofinite topology. Now, before we get to the example, let's recall the notion of a Hausdorff space. So I'll have a topological space X. We'll have a topology T, which will just be some collection of open subsets of X. We'll say X comma T is Hausdorff. If for any two distinct points, X and Y in our space, there exists open subsets U and V, disjoint, such that X is in U, Y is in V. So what this says, if we have any two distinct points in our space, we can separate those points by disjoint open subsets. Now, the canonical example of a Hausdorff space is given by the real line with the usual topology. So that's the topology generated by the open intervals. Now, if we have x and y in the real line, x not equal to y, there's a positive distance between them, and we can construct disjoint open intervals by just taking okay, our x and y's the centers, and we'll make each interval with d. So these two intervals come very close to one another, but they never actually intersect. So that gives us our Hausdorff property. Now, other common examples of Hausdorff spaces. If we take okay, any space with a discrete topology, so in that case, every subset is open, then the points themselves will be the open sets. We also have any metric space is a Hausdorff space, essentially by the same argument we gave for the real line. Now, we're interested in examples that are not Hausdorff, so we can first go to the indiscrete topology. Here, X is any space that's not empty. For a topology, we have two open sets, the empty set and X itself. If X has two or more points, then this topology is not Hausdorff. Now, a topologist is going to be unable to tell points apart in the indiscrete topology. If we want to build non-Hausdorff spaces from here, we can keep adding open sets as long as we obey the condition that not all points are closed sets. So if we have a Hausdorff space, that implies a T1 separation axiom, that point sets are closed. Now, Okay, this example gives us an idea of not Hausdorff, but it's not very natural. So you're not likely to come across these in the wild. For a natural example, we first have the cofinite topology. So we'll have X, any non-empty space. The topology that we're gonna use, the open sets are gonna consist of the empty set and the complements of our finite subsets. So cofinite, complements of finite sets. Now, to show that this is a topology, we use the definition of topology using closed sets. So we'd want the empty set in our space to be closed sets, and that follows by definition. For finite unions, okay, the finite union of finite sets is again a finite set. And if we take arbitrary intersections, okay, arbitrary intersection of finite sets is again gonna be a finite set. So we have the conditions for topology satisfied. Now, if our space is finite, then the complement of any finite subset is also finite. So every closed subset is also open. That means we're working in the discrete topology, so our space is Hausdorff. Otherwise, if our space is infinite, then we'll lose the Hausdorff property. In fact, we'll show the intersection of any two non-empty open subsets is non-empty. So we're unable to separate any two distinct points by disjoint open subsets. Now to see this, let's take two non-empty open subsets, U and V. So they're complements of the finite subsets F1 and F2. If we take their intersection, we can write that as a complement of F1 union with F2. Since X is infinite, 
F1 union F2 is finite. That means this subset is infinite, so it's non-empty. Now, let's consider the example. Okay, we'll have the real line for our space. We'll compare the cofinite and the usual topologies. For the cofinite topology, the open sets are either the empty set, or we take the real line and throw away some finite subset. For the usual topology, we're just going to generate that with the open intervals. Now, if we take open set from here, okay, all of these subsets where I take the real line, discard finite set of points, it's going to be an open subset in the usual topology. On the other hand, the interval, say from 0 to 1, it's not going to be in the cofinite topology. So we're going to have fewer open subsets in the cofinite topology, which means the cofinite topology is coarser than the usual topology. So not as much separation of points. Now, additional facts about the cofinite topology. First, it satisfies the T1 separation axiom. So point sets are closed. Point sets are finite, so closed. We have compact. I'll show that on the next board. This is interesting because we see how close we come to being a metric space. So note, if our space is infinite, we're not Hausdorff, so we can't be a metric space. But we have a result that says for compact Hausdorff second countable, then we can put a metric on our space. So that shows that we'll hit out at least one, but definitely not one also. To show that X is compact, we need to show that every open cover U sub I of our space admits a finite subcover. Now, one of our open sets is the space itself. We're done. Okay, then our finite subcover has exactly one open set in it. Otherwise, we have some non empty U sub I. So we'll call that the complement of the finite subset F sub I. Now, if F sub I has the points X1 through X sub K, because we have an open cover, each of these x's is going to live in some open set of the cover. So to get a finite subcover, we use our u sub i, and then we throw in the open sets that cover each of these points individually. So that gives us a finite subcover. So our space is compact. As a final note, where does the cofinite topology occur in the wild? For space, is a field, such as the real or complex numbers, then the cofinite topology is going to be a special case of the Zariski topology in algebraic geometry. We have the machinery for that here, so we just point out the basic ideas. Now, I'll start with the ring of polynomials in Z with complex coefficients. So call that C bracket Z. By the fundamental theorem of algebra, P is non-constant, we can factor it completely into powers of linear factors. If we take the zeros of this polynomial, we're going to get a finite subset of the plane, R1 through Rn, our roots. So what we've done here, I've gone from this ring, C bracket Z, to our cofinite topology, just by taking zeros of polynomials. Now, that's going to give us connection okay, from geometry, okay, zero loci polynomials, to ring theory. So interplay here is just the beginning of the story. 